What is going on, boys and girls? Welcome back to the show, the podcast. This is episode 47, and uh, it feels weird to record right now because it's a Friday afternoon, and I usually record the night before we post. So look at me being ahead of the game here, uh, but that is because we had to accommodate a very special guest. Ashley Sanders is here. Ashley, thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, just how are you doing? What's going on? Well, first off, thank you for having me, and I'm doing really, really well. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. It's... uh. The end of the work week, so feeling much better than I was yesterday. Um, but I will say I went to the movies for the first time yesterday Ooh. in a long time and saw Black Widow, and it kicked ass. So very, yeah, I've heard very good things about that. Yes, it was very good. So I'm actually a little tired because it was a late night for me because I'm mm-hmm. old, but it's okay. Um, but guys, before we get into the big conversations here with Ashley, just a couple of very quick updates. Uh, I will not be streaming for probably about the next week because my capture card uh, pooped out. So Elgato is sending me a free replacement. Shout out Elgato. I appreciate you guys, but I just have to put it in the mail before they can send it to me. So working on that. Uh, Secondly, thank you guys so much. I got a lot of great feedback on the last episode. Sporer was just an amazing guest. And clearly he resonated with all of you guys who were listening and and watching on YouTube. So thank you so much for the feedback. Maybe there's an episode two of Spore sometime in the future. Um, But for right now, Ashley's here. And super excited to talk about a ton of interesting things with her, about her streaming experience, her experience as a woman in gaming and content creation. Uh, But first of all, SDS just knocked content out of the park again. The All-Star Weekend content, I think, was more than anyone expected we'd get. Um, Ashley, what are your takes on literally everything that just dropped? If you can even summarize it into a little bit, because there's so much. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's incredible to say the least. Like I always say, like I'm overwhelmed in the best way. And it, it's literally true. I'm overwhelmed in the best way. Usually when they come out with the content, I completed within a day or two. Yeah, I'm still working on this content. I'm still working on TA3. I have all of like the, the missions and the moments done for the new Ronald Acuna program. But yeah, those TA3 cards, they're fun. The good thing is, especially with the showdown, it's really quickly attainable. Mm -hmm. So I'm more than like 50% done with all of the divisions. In fact, I have two divisions already 100% completed. So I'll be doing a couple more showdowns, most likely later today and really finishing all that off. And then hopefully debuting the 99 Acuna like really, really soon. I'm excited about that card. Yeah, I'm I'm a grinder. And admittedly, (laughs) I get a great deal of FOMO. So as soon as new stuff drops, I have to complete it. So I've gotten the Otani, I've gotten Acuna. Mm -hmm. I love grinding and MLB, the show gives you so many opportunities to grind. Mm -hmm. Like I personally don't love Acuna swing and I know I'm in the minority on that, Mm -hmm. but I still wanted to get the card. So I had to finish it as soon as possible. Um, Acuna is actually one of the things I wanted to touch on. A lot of people were, shouldn't say a lot of people, a lot of people I saw on the timeline were uh, a little upset at the Acuna. Not that the card's not good. Very clearly, the attributes are boosted. You have to remember also that he's hurt now, so we're not going to get a better version of his card. This was their opportunity to do that. But a lot of people thought the tease was maybe like, oh, this is Hank Aaron coming. This is a big, big legend coming. I don't know, what's, what's your take on that? Are you happy with this? Did you expect something else? What are you thinking? I was definitely on the 99 Hank Aaron train. However, I'm still stoked about the 99 Acuna because that just means there's more legends in the future. I mean, there has to be. There has to be if we're getting like a live series kind of 99 card. So if anything, I think it just opens up the door for more programs. It opens up the door for more legends and even uh, like live series type 99 cards. Like, come on, Tatis Jr. is the cover boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're still waiting on his 99 card. So uh, I know Ramon teased a while ago that a 99 Mariano Rivera was not the only 99 program reward. I'm assuming kind of like with Otani and Acuna, they are not uh, done uh, after these three cards. And I don't see how they could be because Mm -hmm. Hank Aaron has to be one of the big 99 rewards. Uh, Roberto Clemente is new to the game this Mm -hmm. year. He'll absolutely be one. I don't know how good his card will be in an overall sense, but that's beside the point. Um, But then you look at things we haven't gotten yet that you'd think would come first. Like, Mm -hmm. You'd never get a 99 Hank Aaron before a Kirby Puckett. We still haven't gotten the high-rated Kirby Puckett. Like there, there's like an order of operations. There's a PEMDAS sure. to how this mm-hmm. is supposed to work. And we still have not gotten like those, I don't want to call them middle-tier 99s because all 99s are, are good. But yeah, you would think a Hank Aaron card will be overall better than a Kirby Puckett just yeah, using like you, you logical reasoning so, especially when you like consider all the parallels and the super factors and those bonus stats you would definitely think that 
And, and one of the things that they did so well with this all-star content too, you know, they dropped TA3 as the all-star cards. That was just their strategy. And I love that. I think that was great. But then they set themselves up for, for potential disaster. They, they named all these TA3 cards mm-hmm. before any all-star events happened. And they were like, well, I hope the guys we just did, you know, cards for don't do mm-hmm. something again. Then we got to give them more cards again on top of that immediately. I think they only doubled up on like Real Muto and Salvador Perez because he was in the home run derby. Uh, Otani doubled up, but I don't really think that counts because one is so clearly superior to the other. Um, There's a Matt Olson duplicate. Matt Olson duplicate. But there weren't a lot. And yeah, I don't know how they do it. I don't know. They, they take calculated risks and it seems to work. Um, do you have a, a favorite of the cards that have dropped in, in the last week or so? Yeah. Uh, I rake with that Trey Turner card. I mean, oh, yeah. he's all around in my opinion, if not the best like middle infielder, he is the best middle infielder. I mean, besides speed and fielding his batting both for power and contact is literally insane. I mean, I was working on the Acuna missions as prefaced earlier and this guy was going for like cycles. I mean, granted it was CPU rookie against the Rockies to quickly knock out these missions, but like his swing is so smooth, like butter. We count those. We count rookie missions. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I let him count. Um, <laughs> Turner is my second baseman and ranked for now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wish his defense was better. I know it's, you know, they boost his hitting a little bit. His defense, they couldn't boost. His defense is not fantastic. But uh, yeah, like you said, that swing is just, it's crisp. Mm-hmm. Um, and the pros, I, say, I use the word problem here in a personal sense. Like I get married to cards I use. Mm-hmm. And before TA3 dropped, I had my guys. I was like, I've had at least 150 ABs with all these guys. I love their swings. I'm used to them. And now they drop all these like fire 97, 98, 99s. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> what do I do? Who do I take out? Who do I have to divorce? It's, it's, it's not going to be an amicable, uh, amicable divorce either. I'm going to be upset. Um, mm-hmm. But Turner instantly slid into second base. I don't know how you can't use him. Like he has to be mm-hmm. on teams. Salvador Perez should be on everybody's bench. Mm-hmm. Even in the starting lineup's cool. Uh, I think mm-hmm. Schwarber's the better one. Uh, but they just dropped so many, so many usable cards. And yeah, it's it's amazing. I yeah. mean, the lineup diversity in literally what the beginning, middle of July, and the fact that we're only going to get more cards from here is incredible. Like, I'm just looking forward when I like return during seasons that I've been grinding like the events and all that fun stuff that I won't be facing the same lineup over and over and over. I'm going to basically get a new look each and every game. And like that excites me the most. And uh, what year did you first start playing MLB the show? I would say competitively, not just like offline stuff. Like when did you start playing online and things like that? All right. So competitively last year. Okay. So I'm relatively new for competitive diamond dynasty wise. So even from last year, lineup mm-hmm. diversity has improved considerably. Because yes. what, I, what the point I was going to make is like, I've been playing online since like 14, 15. Mm-hmm. Obviously the game in itself has taken immense strides since then. So things will change over time naturally, but every lineup used to be the same. Mm-hmm. It would be at literally every single lineup was identical and starting maybe in like 19, but most certainly last year lineups are different. Everyone has mm-hmm. like their preferences Everyone has swings they like. And I mean, how could lineups be the same? There's so many cards. Um, it, that was a big complaint the community had. So it's, I'm glad you're in the competitive scene because now you, you, oh, you started it. in such a good place where like, yeah. I mean, well, gameplay has its flaws. We, we don't mm-hmm. need to talk about that. But content wise, <laughs> content wise, you started in such a good place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, pretty cool to go from like road to the show for so many years, uh, then to finally join the competitive scene, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, last year I was able to make it to the 800s and ranked, but uh, this year I really plan to get that World Series trophy. Oh, trophy, you will. I guess I could say. You, you absolutely will. Uh, I was a career like 600 player until <laughs> I got a monitor last year and made World Series. And that was yeah. like the first time I really started playing the right way. Like I mm-hmm. invested in a monitor. I focused on actually improving myself, not just like mindlessly going about things. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 you'll, you'll get there. Every, everybody right. gets there. It's, and especially if you're in the 800s, all you got to do is go on a hot streak. You win five games, you're there. Yeah. Um, this, this is a good opportunity to transition into, you know, talking about being a woman in, not just in gaming. There are plenty of, <laughs> of, of women who play video games. It's, it's not uncommon. It's, it's you're a, a content creator in a sports gaming field or an arena 
And that is necessarily not something you see a ton. So there's a couple things to, to kind of talk about here. And I want you to lead this conversation because I'm not the person who should be leading the conversation. That said, I'm so intrigued in what motivated you to get into it. And, you know, I see the trolls you deal with. I don't deal with them personally, of course, mm -hmm. but I feel like if I was the one dealing with them, it would frustrate me to no end. So how do you, how do you figure it out and deal with it? Yeah, um, to say the least, it can be a lot. However, at the end of the day, it is incredibly rewarding. So if you want like the origin story, um, I've always been a fan of sports, always been playing it, been watching it ever since I was young. And that really comes from my mom, who was a huge baseball fan, huge White Sox fan. She's how I got into the White Sox fandom. And so um, to kind of um, parallel that parallel that alongside like the trolling comments like the oh my god there's a woman here there's a woman here there's a female here don't even get me started on the word female <laughs> um it's like I didn't know you played baseball wait people like baseball who aren't guys it's like yes they do and like to me that's always a bit taxing because like I see my mom being a huge baseball fan I see my nana so my mom's mom she's a huge football fan she's how I got into the Packers uh fan base and so it's always a bit startling it's always a bit puzzling and most importantly uh it's just a precursor that uh we're not done yet in terms of our work in terms of getting more accurate representation in not only the sports world but the gaming world and then of course outside of twitch like how do our everyday lives look and how are we getting representation and not just gender but uh in other demographics such as sexual orientation such as your racial uh profile uh however however many different de demographics you wish to go into, but I think it starts there is the fact that because uh, women are so underrepresented uh, in the sports world, in gaming, you can even look at Major League Baseball, like a broadcasting level. I know on this upcoming Tuesday on July 20th, we're having our first female broadcasting mm -hmm. crew uh, for the Orioles game, which is beyond exciting. Everyone from the play-by-play -play to the analyst, uh, to the reporters on the field, are all going to be women and like the fact that that's happening for the very first time in 2021 is both exciting because you can only go up from here but it's also kind of like uh how hasn't this happened before kind of thing but of course on the same note you're excited that this is happening you're excited that you can only go up from here and like that's how i kind of take my twitch in the sense that um uh, there are women who came before me there are women that are going to come after me but uh, I have recognized that uh, I am a leading female voice in the MLB The Show community specifically. And if I have to deal with those trolls, I have to either call them out, time them out, or even ban them if I have to. Um, whatever I have to do to create a safe space, to create a respective space, and more importantly, uh, creating as diverse of a space as possible so that other people uh, can join this world and really get a kick out of it. Because at the end of the day, uh, the Sand Squad is incredible. 99.999% of the viewers who come into stream are absolutely amazing. And like, I'm so incredibly fortunate for them because they help me. Uh, when I see all of these comments in a row with a whole bunch of different derogatory terms, it's nice at the end of the day that they're like, don't listen to that. Hey, we got you. We're going to show up every day. Um, and that's what keeps me going at the end of the day. That's a great way to put it. And, you know, the goal is obviously always to improve personally, professionally, as a society, as a world, all these types of things. But it, it has to be reassuring when you see that 99.99, whatever percent it is. And knowing that most of those people are probably men, just because the nature of Twitch and the nature of stream. Obviously, you do have a very strong following of, of women in gaming and baseball fans and sports fans in general. Mm -hmm. But just the demographics of this, most of the people watching, I mean, you go into a stream of yours lately, it's 250 people. Like, you're killing it. You're, you're, <laughs> you're broadcasting to a ton of people. And they're the good ones, the ones who are supporting you and the ones who are, you know, it doesn't matter if you're male, female, anything, whatever race, gender does not matter. They're there because they like what you're doing. They like your content mm -hmm. and they love the game. That's, that's the shared experience everyone can yes. have. Um, you know, wh when you're in your streams, do you, <clears throat> excuse me, do you actively talk about all of these types of things you're passionate about as far as, you know, equality and, and getting more women into gaming, or are you trying really just to stick to the, to the game in front of you? 
Um, absolutely the first part of that statement and besides the latter like I recognize that there you need to create a balance in the mm -hmm. sense that I do recognize that for a lot of people twitch is an escape however a part of that conversation is what are they escaping from and that's something that I like to address like all of our everyday lives are different like I don't know what people in chat go through just like they don't know what I go through off screen off camera off live streaming etc so I always try to find that balance of you know what let's play this game let's enjoy it however if there's a troll that comes in obviously I can recognize decently at this point are they just trolling to get attention or are they trolling because they truly need to discuss a conversation, talk about something because maybe there's a gap in their knowledge, maybe there's a gap in something that has produced this statement, this opinion, whatever it is that they are now uh, transmitting on stream. So I definitely have conversations. Um, so I stream six days a week. We're probably having these conversations at the very least three to four days a week. Uh, they can be as brief as five minutes. They can be as uh, lengthy as maybe even a half an hour, 45 minutes, or just a theme we go back to uh, throughout the stream, whether in that day or in the week. So I'm, I'm definitely not afraid to discuss real life topics, even if it involves politics, even if it involves equality, even if it involves just conversations in general that might make some people uncomfortable. However, my number one rule is, is the second someone is uh, disrespectful to someone else, the second someone starts calling someone else names, we take a break. We mm -hmm. take a break. You know, I do want to promote a healthy, uh, communicable, communicable uh, atmosphere. The second we kind of overstep that boundary, it's okay. Let's enjoy the game for five, 10 minutes. We can either revisit this later in the stream, uh, later in the week. But uh, I never want to shut out conversation because that's how we kind of keep to almost this closed-minded um, um, uh, view on anything you mm -hmm. wish to discuss. I always want to invite conversation because you can't change something if you can't talk about something. But again, on the same side, I always want to um, respect the fact that Twitch can be seen as an escape. Let's play some video games, but at the same time, if we need to discuss some real life issues, let's discuss some real life issues. And, you know, part of all this conversation, specifically in sports gaming, is it is kind of the boys club. Mm -hmm. Again, just the nature of how it's always been. That doesn't mean we can't disrupt it. Clearly, you're disrupting it and doing a great job of it. And we should, you know, it should include anybody who's good at or just loves the game and passionately mm -hmm. talk about it or play it. That's who should be involved in, in everything. So with that being the point, uh, how has SDS, you know, open their arms to you and what's your relationship been like with them working with them and even some of the other big creators uh, you know on the scene oh it's fantastic I have so many uh content creator friends who uh if not for their support it's like I don't know how any person that doesn't fit that boys club majority uh would be able to make it in here like uh, I understand that uh, it's kind of like the whole debate with women's sports in general. Mm -hmm. You have the debate of, well, we don't want to watch them. Well, do you really not want to watch them? Or if they were actually televised, would you watch them? I'm actually live streaming as a woman. And when you finally get people live streaming, people will watch you. And that's how you kind of change that boys club narrative. And that's another reason why I kind of persevere through all the hate that I'll get sometimes, mostly, of course, coming from trolls, mm -hmm. is that uh, if someone else can see me streaming, that will hopefully invite them to stream. And then, of course, changing that narrative. But uh, going back to the original question, of course, yeah, I have just incredible friends from Bunk Tuzi to Dude Food uh, to many of basically all of the content creators that I was able to meet and become friends with through the Content Creators League last year. Um, I have so many friends and allies uh, on Twitch and it's absolutely incredible to have that uh, backbone, have that support system. SDS is incredible. Um, with those content creators from the uh, CCL, we are in a Discord with some of the devs. So the communication is always so open. They're always so kind. Uh, they visit stream every once in a while, which is always very exciting. Yeah. And you know, going back to your other point, it's totally about exposure. Exposure and open-mindedness are the two most important things, in my opinion, when it comes to the, the women's sports conversation. Mm -hmm. So prior to my current job, I was a high school sports reporter back home on Long Island, high school and college sports. That's cool. So, you know, loved the job, ended up being a dream job. I got to even cover some Yankees and Mets games, which was unbelievable for me, mm -hmm. beside the point, though. So as a high school sports reporter, you have to learn quickly that there are a lot of sports you've probably never even thought existed that you will have to write mm -hmm. about. Fencing, for instance, 
um, was one. Gymnastics, which obviously I knew existed, didn't think I'd ever have to go cover it. Mm -hmm. I did. But, you know, I was assigned a beat every season. My very first year at, at, at this place, I was assigned to girls volleyball, girls basketball, and girls lacrosse. I played basketball growing up, so I knew what basketball was. Girls basketball is fundamentally different. It's a lot more finesse-based, which was refreshing to watch. But what I'm getting at here is that these were not the choices I made to cover those sports, but I ended up working at that place for five years and covered strictly girls sports every single season by choice after that because – you expose yourself to something that you've never seen before. You learn a lot about it. You learn there's a passion there. In my opinion, there's more passion in female or women's sports, rather, sorry, than men's sports, in my opinion. It's a different type of passion. It's not to say men don't play with passion, but it's, it's more like, I feel like it's, it's honest. Like there's true celebration of success, not just of the individual, but of teammates and of other teams even. You very rarely see men's players or athletes complimenting rivals whereas on in women's sports it's like hey we're all in this together like we're all competing here we're all doing the same thing we all have the same goal we're just doing it in different places um and that completely opened my eyes i was never a women's sports hater necessarily but i never gave it the time because i was always so focused on something else and by just simply exposing yourself and allowing yourself a, you know, you can't say, oh, I'll give it a week. You have to give it a little time. And by giving it the proper amount of time, your entire world could be flipped upside down. And I think that's just a lesson outside of sports, too, for anybody who's trying to see the other side of something, whatever that may be, whether it's sports related, politics, this side or the other thing. Um, but yeah, basically, all of that was to say, I'm a, I'm a women's sports fan now. And truthfully, I didn't think it would ever be in my stratosphere. So you have to give it time. And I like how you bring that up too, because I think that's a perfect uh, uh, playback or a correlation to Twitch in general. Um, usually when people come in, they're like, oh my God, you're the first woman I've seen. I'm like, I know I'm not the first woman to stream on be this show. And I know I'm not the last woman either. Um, so what I always tell them is a simple, look at the directories. Mm -hmm. I know Twitch has its issues with discoverability in general, but like, look at those directories. Obviously, you know, a lot of the top names, a lot of the guys who've been doing this for years and years are going to be those first couple of live streams that show up when they're live, but truly scroll, truly click on as many as you can. I know people are busy, but of course, um, if you had planned to watch a half an hour of my stream, instead of using that half an hour to watch my stream, use that half an hour and go check out two, three, four, five, however many streams during that time, because you'll find incredible amount of people. I mean, I take my raids like super, super seriously. I love giving back to like the sand squad. Like I love being like, Hey, I know that person. They've been a sub for how long they've been a viewer for even longer. Like, let me go give some love back to them. So on the topic of you, just giving that exposure is so beneficial for like anything in life, um, as you were stating. And like, it's pretty, pretty cool. And I think that's the cool thing, like how you mentioned, like the, the so-called difference of passion is like women in a sense, um, they have to grow together if they want to get anywhere because men already have that exposure. Men already have the, hey, look, I'm going to make this contract. If I lose, okay, of course, people want to win. But uh, mm. it reminds me, you know, the NBA playoffs are currently going on and I'm a big Bucks fan. So uh, when they were playing the Nets, Giannis Anandikumpo uh, gave a huge compliment to Kevin Durant. And uh, the media was like, oh, my God, why, why is he uh, uh, complimenting why is he being nice? his uh, opponent? Like, you're not <laughs> supposed to do that. And he's like, you know, give credit where credit is due. And then, of course, you have the flip side of uh, if he would have just trashed uh, Durant, uh, he would have been mocked up for, like, the rest of his career. So I definitely agree that there's a difference there uh, between the different sports of men's, men's and women's sports. However, I feel like um, as women's sports gets more notoriety, we're going to see more of that compliment, uh, the compliment scene as we should see, you should give credit where you're due. At the same note, we'll definitely see uh, more passion and more like rivalries in order to uh, increase that excitement level. And you talk about the raids and I think this rating in general is something people need to give more of a chance to, if that, and let me explain. So like, I am a frequenter of a demo stream. I think everyone who listens to the show knows this. 
when Dimu ends his stream and raids somebody, most of the time he's raiding someone with, you know, I mean, he's averaging like almost 2K per stream. So a lot of the time he's raiding someone who has fewer views than he does. Don't just leave his stream and go click on Kooks, who has the same amount. I mean, you could be a fan of whoever you want. And Kooks is a great person. I'm not saying you can't go into Kooks' stream. What I'm saying is like, if Dimu's going to raid somebody with like 10 viewers, go hang out in that guy's stream for 15, 20 minutes or that, that woman's stream. Make that person's day. Or give it a chance. Maybe this person's really, really interesting and you vibe with him or, or her and you have, I don't know if you can really tell shared experiences within 15 minutes, but maybe you have some sort of similarity that will get you interested in that person. And now you've made a, a new streamer friend. Like you have to let the raid occur. Don't just mm -hmm. hop out immediately. Like go see what else is there. Like you said, Twitch sucks with discoverability. It truthfully does. Yeah. And raids are the best way to discover people you've never heard of, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree 100%. Like, um, for every single stream, you know, in case I, if, even if I did forget, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, every single raid, excuse me, I'm always like, you know what, I would really appreciate you all to stick around for the raid. Like, I not only would appreciate it, but the person who we're about to raid is going to appreciate it, like, exponentially. Like, I can't even tell you the amount of messages I get of just a, a simple thank you to a simple, hey, I met this, this, and this person from your community, we really kicked it off, or hey, uh, uh, your community really helped me reach uh, Twitch affiliation. So like just to spread that positivity, just to spread like the growth of others, uh, you really do make a lot of connections. I mean, I'll, I'll throw it back to Shelfie. Uh, Shelfie was my first big raid on Twitch and I am forever thankful for him. Shelfie's probably uh, a really big supporter of mine. I'm a really big supporter of his. And um, if not for that, I don't know, like, how my community would look in the sense that I still get messages of uh, like whenever I ask Chad, like, oh, hey, you know, how did you come across the stream? They're like, oh, through the Shelfie raid um, are some of their answers. And it's pretty cool to see, like, if you just stick with that raid, these people are here, what, like 10, 11 months later from that moment, if not over a year at this point. So uh, it's really, really special, as you said, the kind of connections you can make if you just give it at least like, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes if you're able to stick around. And, you know, that's the beauty, I think, of our MLB The Show community that we have. Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm not going to say it's exclusive to MLB The Show because I've never really been in other gaming communities like this. I know there's a lot more animosity in a lot of other gaming communities. But, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, I, had, I went through some really life-changing stuff. My mom passed unexpectedly. And the amount of people who I've never met, who I don't even think we had Twitter interactions before, they might not even listen to the show. They might not have ever caught one of my streams who just saw my post and said like, Hey man, we're all here for you. Like I, I've talked about this in previous episodes, like that really means more than you think. And just the support among people here, it, it doesn't have to be something as extreme as what I'm describing, but like mm -hmm. hanging out in a raid shelfie showing you some love. And now not only are you guys, you know, uh, uh, friends and, and you've met each other's viewership and it's all intermingled and like, we're all here to help each other. We're all here for the most part. I shouldn't say everybody. Most people are here to help you and, you know, make anything for you better than it was the day before. And I think personally, that's been my experience in this community. And, and I just think it's really cool. I think it's really, really cool. Like I've been doing this show for a year now, which is wild to me. This was my COVID project because I was bored and it's like, you know, I'm not going to pretend I'm big time because I'm not, but like I can see how much I've grown from a year ago to now. And it's all because of this community. Yeah, thank you for sharing that experience. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's incredible the kind of support I get. I, I know I've mentioned this now a few times, but like uh, the different messages, whether it's through Twitter, uh, uh, Twitch whispers, Instagram DMs, uh, Discord messages. Um, it's very eye-opening to see just going from like the simple thank yous to a simple, uh, hey, Ashley, this is how you specifically like helped make my life better. This is how you helped change it. Or the ones that really make me feel the greatest are like, you know, thank you for fostering. Thank you for creating a community where I belong. I now want to stream. Um, I want to hang out in your stream whenever you're live. I'm, I'm sad uh, when you're not streaming on Sundays or you have to take off for some day throughout the week. Um, it's, it's really, really touching and really, really special, um, the connections and messages you receive. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason why I was so excited that you agreed to come on the podcast, because I have only had male guests on. And while, as we've discussed, that is a larger percentage of this community, it's not 100%. And you need to show 
the many different types of people. I wanted to hear your story. I'm sure some of my listeners want to hear your story. And this is, this is what our community looks like. It's like, it's every different type of person. So having you on was a great opportunity, obviously, first of all, just to get to know you, because that's, that's the, I, I like when I, when I have the content creators on here, it's not just a straight grilling session of like, how do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do this? Mm-hmm. It's like, get to know the person behind the stream or the, or the YouTube video or the, or whatever it is. And so, you know, we're made up of all different types of people in this community. So I thought that was, that that's really why I was excited to have you on here. So thank you for being here again. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, that's, that's another reason that uh, I care so much about creating a safe space and a diverse space in the Twitch chat is recognizing that um, uh, there are many different people. I mean, I bring up this comment every time I know you mention it, like, you know, averaging around 250 viewers uh, for the current month is um, I am 100% certain that not all 250 viewers identify the exact same way. Mm -hmm. So I always want to make sure um, that I'm aware of that. Of course, being who I am, I'm aware of that every single day. And to make sure, uh, not only for me, but for everyone else, I mean, I'll I'll bring this up briefly, but uh, I tweeted out uh, last August, a simple like, hey, why do we refer to our Twitch chats, not not our team, not our players, our Twitch chats in particular, as boys in only the show community? Uh, like I just prefaced, I'm like, uh, for the 250 people, I am 100% positive that not, not all 250 of those viewers are boys. So why is it in some chats, whether there's more than 250, whether there's less than 250, are we just assuming that? Um, obviously, I know you can look at the demographics. However, it is not 100% uh, either way. And even then, Twitch only gives you the male-female demographics. As we know, there's a lot more gender diversity that we're becoming more educated about um, as we progress in life. So I um, always wanted to be aware of, like, instead of saying, like, the word boys, even, like, a simple, hey, y'all, hey, everyone, how are we doing? Um, obviously, if you know someone in chat, you know their pronouns, of course do what you will with that but just a simple like be aware I'm not asking you to change your vocabulary like night and day Mm -hmm. like that but just be aware that um, not everyone is who you might expect them to be Um, additionally how you create and how you expand uh, the platform of Twitch and sports in general is to uh, even just by your vocabulary the inclusive atmosphere you can create that will invite uh, non-boys, to say the least, to kind of go back to that boy term, uh, into the atmosphere and into um, content creation in general. You have to know your audience. And ironically, mm-hmm. what that means is that you don't know your audience. Like you have yeah. to be respectful of whoever's in there. Like mm-hmm. I average five viewers a stream. I've only been streaming for a few months. I know every name that's in my chat. So when I say, let's go boys, I know who everybody is in that chat. Mm-hmm. Once you get to a certain point and you don't know hundred percent of the people in your streams, you just got to be respectful. That's all it comes down to. I think 100% of the time, everywhere you do anything, respect is the most important thing. Mm-hmm. And that goes far beyond how people identify respect literally in every sense of the word is important. And unfortunately in gaming communities, across the board, you deal with a lot of people from, first of all, who could be like 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Like you don't know how young, old, or in the middle of these people are. You don't know the backgrounds they come from. Some of them are not as educated as others. Some of them are not as tolerant as others. So you have to have also a level of patience to a degree. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, it's just wild sometimes the things people encounter. And I couldn't imagine being in your shoes and, and hearing, or I guess more so reading the things that you see online. Um, but you get the last laugh because you're still chugging along and, uh, you know, you've got 250 people in your streams, not, not those people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. It's, uh, it is pretty special to see all those trolls and whatever they say. And it's like, you know, you, you go on your own lane. I'm on uh, my lane right now. Exactly. And for people who are listening and not watching, Ashley just did a low key, angle up bar graph type of thing like she is ascending while all you guys are staying flat don't worry but if you're not watching uh youtube please go there uh thank you um uh, so we're gonna take a quick ad break and then finish up guys we have a really interesting conversation after this ad break uh ashley as we've kind of discussed has skyrocketed in the content creation scene in the last year so she's gonna tell you how you can do the same no she's she's gonna get, just give her tips what she did what she's experienced and hopefully one or two of those points might help you obviously everyone's journey is different Um, but she's going to share a little bit about her experience. So first of all, 
let's hear from Thrive Fantasy, the longest sponsor of the show. Uh, very excited to be working with Thrive Fantasy. It's a daily fantasy sports app that is based around player props. Thrive Fantasy has eliminated the need to do countless hours of research like those other DFS apps because it only asks you about the top tier athletes in a respective sport. To play MLB games on Thrive Fantasy, you will choose five out of the 10 player prop options to build your lineup. Each prop has a fantasy point total associated with the over or under based on how likely it is to occur. The more points a selection is worth, the riskier it is. Rack up the most points possible and you could win a share of the prize pool. If you're looking to play games and make money during the MLB season, use promo code the show the pod. That's promo code the show the pod when you sign up for Thrive Fantasy and you'll receive an instant $20 bonus on your very first deposit of $20 or more. Download Thrive Fantasy on the App Store or Play Store or by going online to www.thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. Uh, and finally, Dugout Creative. We're just ditching. If you guys are watching on YouTube, we're ditching the ad read because I, it changes every week. So here's what you need to know about dugoutcreative.com. Uh, they have merch for some of your favorite streamers, your favorite teams, your favorite cities, your favorite sports. And it's all hella comfy. I can attest to that because I have some stuff. Uh, dugoutcreative.com, coupon code KDJTV will get you 15% off. Uh, if you use my promo code, first of all, thank you. Second of all, tag me and show me what you got. Um, also, I have merch now. It's on a, a Teespring site, which I've now been told is just called Spring. Uh, but I will link to that in the YouTube comments, and it's pinned to my Twitter page, uh, KDJTV611. We have uh, mugs and shirts and more designs coming. Uh, I'm not good at designing stuff, so please give me tips and uh, it's, tell me what you'd like to see. If you want face masks or neck gaiters or uh, they have women's uh, leggings. If you want show the podcast women's leggings, please let me know and I guess I'll make them for you. So thank you very much. And uh, we're back to Ashley now who's been sitting here patiently. So Twitch, mm -hmm. as we've discussed, very bad for discoverability. Mm -hmm. Very good for giving a lot of people opportunities. You don't really need much other than equipment. And even then, you don't need a ton of equipment. You can get by with as much or as little as you want. At the same time, growing on Twitch can be a bear. Um, if you could walk me through when, when you first started streaming, what those early couple months were like, just kind of grinding it out. And then maybe like, when was that day when you were like, wow, things are just different now? Yeah, so uh, it all happened really fast. So <laughs> kind of like you, how you started this podcast a year ago with the opportunity that we got from the very unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic, um, I decided to uh, grasp that opportunity and go live. So May 8th, 2020 was my very first stream on Twitch. I had my TV, I had my PlayStation 4, and I had this really crappy $30 PlayStation headset. The mic quality was horrendous. Um, how I was ever able to get this get to this position, I really attribute uh, to all of the OG viewers, <laughs> I like to call them. And uh, speaking of OG, uh, yeah, I sat on my floor. So I had a very small TV stand in my room. Even if I wanted to sit on like the lowest leveled chair, I would still be too high for the TV. So I was a floor streamer for uh, <laughs> several months until November 2020 when I was able to get a more proper desk set up. However, that's a bit of a tangent now. <laughs> um, so um, I like how you specified you don't really need all this um, hundreds, thousands of dollars equipment to get, to get started. You just have to go live and then you kind of go from there. Um, I think what really helped me in specifics was my energy. Um, I don't know how I do it sometimes. Um, I've never had any sort of energy drink in my life. I probably have had coffee maybe like three times. I love the smell of coffee, not too fond of the taste. I also but, don't uh, like the taste of coffee. So we're in the same, same camp on that one. There we go. There we go. And it was just the energy and the passion for baseball in general. You know, I was inspired. I know SDS did the players league, uh, each player from their, uh, their uh, respective major league baseball club participate in the uh, players league. Lucas Giolito was the White Sox representative. He's also my favorite White Sox player. And I, I write for uh, Southside Sox, the White Sox website. And at the time we were in a partnership with Sports Illustrated. So I asked my boss, I was like, Hey, yo, can I watch Lucas's streams and uh, write about them? 
And so he was like, yeah, go ahead. So I would watch Lucas's streams. I'd write about them. Uh, that's how I pretty much discovered that Twitch is not synonymous with Fortnite. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, I've had a Twitch account since like 2018, but you know, just watch like the Lupos and the Ninjas on Fortnite. So I really discovered like the expansiveness that Twitch is in the gaming world. And um, uh, those articles that I wrote, you know, I posted them on Twitter, uh, they gained a little bit of traction, especially with SDS that near the end of the Players League, I was like, hey, uh, if Lucas makes it to the World Series, which he did against Blake Snell, I'm going to purchase MLB The Show 20, because the only MLB The Show game I had was MLB The Show 17, uh, which I got in 2018. So I've been playing that road of the show up until May of 2020. And uh, SDS saw that and they're like, hey, I hope you haven't gotten the game yet. Uh, we really like your articles. We're really happy you've been following along with the Players League. Uh, here's a digital deluxe edition of the game. And then they DM'd me the uh, Twitter or the, or the, um, the code to uh, get for the game. And I was like, oh, OK. So like <laughs> we got Lucas G. Lido, you know, his parents have read the articles. He had called me out on stream sometime, you know, thanking me for that SDS. Uh, they were so very grateful and generous to uh, give me a free copy of their game. And I'm like, summer just started. I was taking a summer class at the same time, but I'm like, you know what? Just go live. Like, I've been thinking about doing it. Might as well do it. This I'm not going to get a better opportunity. So as stated before, I went live with my headset, my PlayStation 4, uh, a little blanket on the floor, and then my TV. And from then on out, uh, I was increasing uh, average viewers mostly every single stream. Like um, I was very fortunate and I'm still grateful that I reached Twitch affiliate in the minimum seven days required because you have to stream, you know, seven mm -hmm. unique days um, with the three average viewership, the 50 followers. So I was very grateful for that. I kept meeting amazing people. So I was joining their communities and uh, just making a lot of new friends. People were finding me, and uh, which still surprises me because like, like I said, you know, I entered uh, Twitch in May. So I had missed so much content. You know, I still wasn't familiar with how SDS released content. So even on those like big content drops, I was still increasing average followers, which is uh, very, very cool, you know, considering, you know, when the big content dropped, you know, people uh, more likely than not go to you know, the people at the top of the directory, which of course I recognize that I'm mm -hmm. now one of those names too. But I never want to lose sight of like, you know, where I came from. So it was very, very neat that two months later in July, um, I had reached the qualifications to apply to become a Twitch partner. So I was like, heck yeah. Uh, but the thing about it is I never told anyone. I never told anyone how close I was. I never said anything on Twitter. I never even told any of my really good Twitch friends that I uh, was currently applying to become a Twitch partner. Uh, I think the biggest thing was, is like, I was scared. I was scared, you know, like, what if I'm denied, which is nothing to be ashamed of. You know, many, many people have been denied X amount of times and then finally they get in. You just got to keep with it, got to persevere. But I really kept it low key. The only people who knew were my family. And so then a month later in August, I had received the email that uh, I was accepted to become a Twitch partner on the very first attempt, which uh, as prefaced is pretty much unheard of. It's hard. And uh, throughout those three months of being a Twitch affiliate, waiting to hear back from Twitch partner. And as we kept on growing the Sand Squad community, I'm like, we can do something with this. And which you've already mentioned, and we've already had a wonderful conversation about with women, women in sports, like, uh, this is kind of my scene. This is where I kind of make an impact. You know, everyone grows up wanting to change the world. And um, although I might not change the world, I know I've uh, definitely impacted even in the slightest uh, many people's lives, just like they've impacted my lives. I like to argue even more than I've impacted theirs. And um, it's very, very special, but I do want to go back real quickly to that $30 headset. <laughs> um, I did not actually upgrade my microphone. Um, until I applied for Twitch partner. So that being said, uh, I, did get, I did not get a new microphone until like three days, four days before I became eligible to apply for Twitch partner. So uh, <laughs> even with the bad audio, if you can interact with chat, if you can bring something unique, I know the energy of mine is very unique. Um, you know, I can talk a mile a minute and I read everybody's chat. I always feel bad if I miss something, but I do have to recognize I'm human at the end of the day. Um, just to bring something unique, even if it isn't a hundred percent unique, but like give someone a reason to watch you. You know, I had my energy, I had my knowledge. I know I'm not the only one with energy and knowledge and uh, you can truly take yourself places. Yeah. So using my very rudimentary math skills here, you went from May, 2020 
zero to one viewer on probably day one to 14 months later, 250 and on the rise, of course, not stopping at 250. That's 14 months. Anyone who's listening, intimidated by growth or frustrated by lack of growth, it could pop off at any time. You just have to be consistent. You have to have a set of skills. And what I mean by that is you don't have to be good at the game. Does it help? Probably. But like, does also doesn't hurt if you suck. If you have a good time while you do it, that's all that matters. And if you're interacting with chat, that's all that matters. Like, you know, one of the big things that people say in the content scene about, you know, oh, how do I grow? Well, you have to diversify your content in that you can't just stream. Um, some people grow through TikTok. Some people grow through YouTube. What Ashley did is kind of actually a, a very unique way is that used her written content as a means of like, I'm going to get myself out there with this. First of all, you're, you were passionate about it. It wasn't a means to an end for you, but like it ended up working that way to some degree. Um, and just by doing that content, Lucas Giolito finds out about it. SDS finds out about it. And then boom, suddenly, you know, all that plus a passion and drive to stream and, and 14 months later, look, look what's happening. So you have to be passionate. You can't, you know, slack around about it. You also just, it takes a certain sense of knowing what people want or kind of having an idea what you think they like. Some people don't know what they want is what I'm trying to get at. You have to give them something that, wow, this is, I didn't know I needed this. Um, and it's, it's, it's so interesting because there's, I don't know, thousands upon thousands of streamers on Twitch period. There are people going back to the discoverability conversation you'd never know that your favorite streamer might be someone who right now has just one viewer. That might be your favorite streamer ever. And sometimes it's just a matter of time before things pop off. So you have to stay with it. Um, if there is a set of tips you could give, again, it's not blanket. Everybody has different roads, different paths, but things that worked for you that you think are just pretty general baseline things. What, what would some of those things be? I would say the very number one thing in my personal opinion is consistency. Um, obviously, I streamed a lot. I streamed Monday through Saturday. I'm not asking everyone to stream six days a week, especially as we're returning to normalcy. But uh, being as consistent as possible. I know that can be diff difficult with school schedules, with work schedules. But uh, if you, like for me, for example, I streamed Monday through Saturday. Uh, at the time, I was like a 1.30 to 4.30 streamer. Now I'm like a 1 to 4 p.m. Central time. Um, so that means people expected that during the week, in the afternoon, I was live, they could find me. Um, so if you aren't able to have that consistency in the sense of, hey, my work schedule changes every two weeks, as long as you have a schedule, the more places, the better. I always put my schedule up on Twitch and on Discord. So, you know, more eyes, the better on the schedule. You can be like, okay, here's the schedule. It's, I post it every Sunday on the off day. Okay, Ashley is live Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, I work Monday and Wednesday. Bet on Thursday, she has it all scheduled. I'm off. I can go show up on stream. So to have that consistency, to have a laid out schedule, if possible, uh, is always my number one advice. Um, my number two advice would be uh, don't worry about the viewer count. And don't worry about it at all, whether you've been streaming for the first day or for a million days. And when I say don't worry, I mean really don't worry about it when you're live. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you that I wasn't thinking about it like 24 seven off stream or even on stream admittedly. Um, even if there's no one chatting, you, you, you as, the, as the streamer have to invite that conversation. So what are you saying? Are you just sitting there and playing your game well, then you're just sitting there and playing a game. You're not actually streaming. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between just playing the game and streaming. Invite conversation. Um, even if there's no one there, have no fear. Do a little play-by-play. -play. Um, ask questions. Uh, talk about highlights within the game. Whatever you have to do to get by. Um, just making sure you have that like rotating door that when people come in, uh, I always like to tell people um, uh, there's definitely more lurkers than viewers in any given time, you know, they might only be there for five minutes. So they might not even show up as a viewer mm -hmm. in those five minutes, but just being aware of uh, there will be eyes on you at some point. Uh, when you have those eyes, it is then uh, your responsibility, if you wish to kind of make something out of this, to give them a reason to stay. And that's how we kind of go back to, uh, I guess, tip number three is, um, what are you giving people? You know, is it your energy? Is it your passion? Um, is it your knowledge and this, this and that? Um, whatever else that's unique to you. I don't want to keep you like boxed up into like those three things, 
but uh, those are what really, really helped me personally. And I'm, I'm happy you mentioned the lurkers versus like performing type of aspect, because it's one of the things I wanted to say is Twitch and or whatever streaming software you use does not update your viewers instantaneously. And it's not always going to catch people who are just there for even a minute. Sometimes there are people going through the directory just saying, hmm, this person's streaming MLB The Show. I'm going to click on it. And if you're just sitting there quietly, even if you think it's just you and Nightbot, it might not be just you and Nightbot. That person might end up just being a lurker. Doesn't mean this person's going to have a conversation. But you have to keep the energy or at least the the passion or the drive moving. You can't be stagnant. That's not to say you can perform 100% of the time for three or four hours. That's unreasonable. You have to set yourself realistic expectations. But at the same time, just know that just because chat's not scrolling or moving, even if your chat's still on that very first page of text, there could be people in there watching you who are looking for a reason to come back. And if you don't give them the reason to come back, they will not come back. Probably, you know, again, you can't, always make that determination across the board. But like if they're just going through the directory to find a new person to watch, you want, you want to be that person. You want to appeal to as many people as possible, give them that chance. Um, and it, it's so interesting that we keep going back to this discoverability conversation because I think it is so important. Recognizing that Twitch does not work the way maybe everyone would like it to means you should not try harder, but just, just be cognizant of that. You have to be aware of how it works and just know that every single minute you're live is another opportunity for you to appeal to somebody. Um, and it makes it sound like such a tall, daunting task. At the end of the day, we all have fun doing this. Like some people do do this for a living or hope to do it for a living. And to those people, I wish them the honest, best of luck because it's, it's a dream career path for so many people. But even for people who do it for fun, I'd still like people to watch. Like, I don't need a thousand people in there, but it'd be cool if there were like, I don't know, 50. Like, you have to just realize that growth is always attainable anytime you're live, even if it's like, I'm going to go live at 5 a.m. Well, there's someone else awake right now who's looking to watch that at 5 a.m. So it's just, you know, it's hard to, to talk about the tips like, like we've been saying too, because everybody is coming from different experience levels and, and different, you know, different goals. Some people just want to go live. So like their one buddy down the street can watch them play. Like that's honestly what it is. Um, but it's just, you know, people need to be more realistic people. Like there are people actually who've seen your growth and said, what the heck, how come I'm not growing like that? I've been streaming for three years. Well, you're not offering something good enough. I'm sorry. That's like, honestly, probably what it is, or you're not marketing yourself well enough or, you're not putting in the time in other places. There's so many things. Like you have to be a business person for yourself almost. And I don't know what you're going to school for, what you're studying, but like, I'm sure you have the head on your shoulders to know how to market yourself. Like how do you go about marketing yourself? If we can have that conversation. That's a good question. I'm not a marketing major, <laughs> but uh, I, just to throw it out there. Yeah. I'm a health science and English double major with psychology and chemistry minors. So, oh, so uh, I think really- okay really what that says is like, I'm a passionate learner. If I can learn about anything and everything, like I want to learn about everything and everything and anything. So I recognize that, you know, Twitter is a good way to maybe get some people. Um, obviously, of course, they're a balance as we kind of talked about. Every single one of your tweets shouldn't be like, hey, I'm one away from 45 followers. I'm one away from 46. Um, every single tweet shouldn't be like, hey, I'm live. Hey, I'm live. Hey, I'm live. Hey, I'm live. There's a mix of promotion and there's a mix of being you. And then there's a mix of um, making friends, making connections. I mean, that's the majority of it. Like when I go live, um, it's not about uh, the numbers, every single stream or this and that. It's a, uh, hey, I know these people are gonna be here. I can't wait to talk about the games last night or I can't wait. Uh, they were telling me they had an interview. I just wanna talk to them and be friends. And I love how you mentioned that like for some people streaming is literally just so their friend down the street can watch them so they can have that connection. That is like 100% okay to tackle Twitch however you wish to tackle Twitch. But then of course, having the, uh, the knowledge, the experience of like, hey, some things work, some things don't. Of course, there are gonna be more viewers at certain times than others. Best example, content drops. Um, um, as well as um, the biggest thing is kind of putting on uh, 
like glasses in the sense of don't compare yourself to every other streamer, whatever. Um, they're kind of going back to the, like, the, oh, I've been streaming for three years. How did she get so good mm -hmm. or whatever? How did she get that growth? Is a simple of like every single stream, as much as I'm enjoying them, I'm always taking notes, whether that's literally physically taking notes or mentally taking notes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are the people that I'm watching? What are they doing that's working for them? And then how am I, and then what am I doing? What am I doing that's working for me? Um, are there any parallels? Are there any perpendiculars? Um, where can I maybe improve? Where can maybe they improve if they wanted to improve? And uh, always kind of being cognizant of um, you're on your own path. Um, most paths are pretty much unique in terms of Twitch, but there's definitely some perpendiculars where uh, that can help benefit your growth if that's uh, one of your goals. But I definitely think your goal shouldn't be like 100%. I want to make sure I have 100 viewers every single stream. It's a simple hey, if, if, if as many of my stand squad friends are here, I'm going to be a happy camper when I stream. And then, of course, kind of go off of that. Excellent advice. Because if you're not having fun while streaming, creating mm -hmm. content, this, even if it's a grind, trust me, I recognize it's a grind. Mm -hmm. I work full time. I have other life obligations. And I do my best to almost always put out a podcast every Tuesday. I don't miss episodes. I really try not to, unless there are extenuating circumstances. And this is not the same as Twitch. This takes an hour. I really don't edit this because I want what you guys hear or see is me. I don't make myself look any better or worse. Well, hopefully not worse, but you know, I'm just giving you guys what I'm putting together, but it, it takes commitment. I sit down most Monday nights at 9 PM getting ready for bed saying, I forgot to record. I need to go record because that's the commitment I set for myself. But it's also fun. I like talking to you guys. You know, even if I'm just rambling by myself without a guest for 30 minutes, you guys know I yawn almost every episode when it's Monday night at nine o'clock and I'm getting, it's a thing, actually. I swear my friend texts me all the time. You only, you only yawn twice this, this episode. Um, but it's, you know, that's, maybe that's my thing. I'm the yawn guy. I don't know. It's just, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And that, that you know, yes, worry about the view count after the fact. Don't let that, screw up your mindset during the stream. Don't let YouTube view counts ruin you. Sometimes things just don't pop off. Like I'm learning TikTok still. I've made like 15 or 20, a couple get 600 views, which I still know is not a lot, but then I've literally had ones get like 11 and you just learn like, Oh, I won't do that ever again. Or like, Oh, maybe I just tagged it wrong. Maybe like you have to, when you talk about taking notes, just learn from your experiences and learn from those of others. Cause they can make the mistakes that now you won't make, you know, you learn from them. Um, such good advice, such good advice. And now Ashley, so we, I've got you for like 10 ish more minutes. I want to be respectful of your time. We're going to talk some white socks. Um, such a fun team. I wish they'd all stay on the field. However, the future maybe has never been brighter for this, for this organization. Um, they do a very good job, they meaning SDS, giving us like an Eloy Jimenez silver slugger. Never thought we'd get that so soon. Um, you know, Lance Lynn gets cards probably too often, but like he's getting cards. You're getting everything you need. What are some things that SDS has not given you as far as like, this was my favorite player growing up and he is still not in the game. Like, what are we missing? Are there any, any guys? So I know I mentioned before that I played Elevator Show 17. However... That was all offline. That was all word of the show. So I believe Carlton Fisk was in that game. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't have the opportunity to play with him. Of course, he's a big wet, White Sox and Red Sox player. He has his numbers retired by both, both organizations. I would love a Carlton Fisk. Um, I know we already have Mini Minoso, so we get him every year, which is awesome because Mini Minoso is my favorite White Sox player of all time. Interesting. Um, the only the only thing that's challenging about Mini Minoso is uh, his swing for me personally. Um, I just don't do well with his swing, even if you're just talking like strict. Hey, maybe he can be the leadoff guy, get a single, get a double every once in a while. No, yeah, it's kind of a noodle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I know you have like Jacoby Ellsbury last year that like I raked with him. Like he was actually one of my best power hitters, which was surprising because, you know, mm -hmm. the noodle swing. So I would love like a usable Carlton Fisk. If anything with Minimino, just keep pumping out those cards. Maybe one of these years, I'll be really good with his swing. Like last year, I was terrible with Jackie Robinson's swing. Mm. This year with the 99 Jackie Robinson, I'm like bopping on everyone. And I'm like, okay, okay, we can change things. He's here. Yeah, he's a right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
And uh, one more thing, like how we mentioned with like the, they had to create all the all-star cards before any of the events. It actually worked out in the White Sox favor because we got the Carlos Rodon, like, you know, base all-star game tier three card. We got Lance Lynn and Liam Hendricks mm-hmm. from the actual all-star game. The only person we missed was Tim Anderson, but he didn't get in that bat in the mm-hmm. all-star game. So, But no uh, knuckleball we'll SDS on Liam Hendricks. What the heck, SDS? <laughs> I know he threw it once, but it was a good one. Exactly, exactly. I'm actually glad he didn't get it. Oh, yeah, no, I know. I'm kidding. Absolutely. <laughs> know, Please don't listen to me if you're even listening here. If Ramon, if you're here, forget I said anything. Um, I, you know, I grew up watching Yankees baseball and there were, there was a, a brief bit of like early to mid two thousands when like the white Sox were good. So I look at players like, you know, they give us weird flashbacks sometimes. So like Scott Pudsednik reminds me of Brett Gardner yes, to some degree could be an interesting that. guy. Uh, Carlos Lee would be such a good bat, mm-hmm. but you never put him in the field probably. Um, when I was talking to Spore last week, Maglio Ordonez is his Tigers guy. Same thing for the White Sox. He was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the White Sox are to some degree like criminally underrepresented in this game. You see that? Yeah. Um, every team should have as many flashbacks as the rest. You know, like there's so many. To, well, I mean, I guess like the Rays and, and Rockies are newer. The Marlins are newer, but every team has had. That's a cool thing about baseball. Players move mm-hmm. around so much that all time squads are fun to make because there's a lot of like interchangeability. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there, are there cards that you have now on the white Sox? Like you mentioned the Rodon or things like that, that you're like super stoked. You never thought you'd have. Ooh, I mean, I, I, I actually just recently got the silver slugger Aloy Jimenez. I haven't tried him out yet, but like I'm pumped about it. I do know we get like a whole bunch of first basin for the White Sox. We get our Abreu's, we get mm-hmm. our Thomas's, we get our Canerco's. Used all of them. Um, the big card that uh, it, it's kind of 50-50 is the Jim Tomey TA2 card. I know mm-hmm. he's suited as Cleveland, but of course he played with the White Sox. And like not a lot of people like his swing, but like it's it's kind of like what we were saying yes, or yesterday, later <laughs> uh, earlier in this podcast. Um, like I'm definitely married to him at first base. And uh, I had to make the decision to make room, you know, put the 95 Santana at first, and then Schwarber can go behind the plate. And like, it's tough because you really, really like these cards. But uh, I remember last year, the Luis Robert card was like incredible mm-hmm. uh, near the end of the game cycle. And I'm really excited to see um, how, if we get a card of his later in the game cycle, we're still kind of waiting on a Yoan Moncada card. But I really, really, really enjoyed the 42 Tim Anderson card. Uh, he absolutely raked for me. And granted, middle infielder, he wasn't going to stay on uh, my Diamond Dynasty team for very long just because of, like, the Trey Turners, mm-hmm. the Simeons, mm-hmm. uh, even the live series Tatis. But um, I really, really, really enjoyed the Tim Anderson card. And um, if I ever need a better bench bat against lefties, if my new guys aren't working, Tim Anderson, he's got a spot on the bench for me. I'm glad you mentioned Moncada because in my opinion, he's like one of the guys across the league that SDS just will not give a better card to. And like, sure. He's usually very consistent. Doesn't always have like a 400 batting average in a month. He's not going to go off for 12 homers in a month. He is just such an uber consistent hitter that you almost not forget about him, but like, why haven't we gotten a player of the month? Not, lightning card but just like yeah. give me a 91 moncada that's all i that's all i ask for that's literally all i want i want to use him in br i want to enjoy myself and and move on i love his swing he's one of my favorite br live series cards to pick and if you give me a 91 of him that would make me so happy mm-hmm. well yeah that kind of brings up when we got the player of the well not like the lightning card but like the player of the month a brave card back in may like as a white Sox fan like I didn't think he deserved that card in comparison to maybe some other uh, guys who got snubbed, but I'm like, okay, if you can get Pito a card, you can sneak (laughs) in that 91 Moncada, you know, early in the game cycle. Yeah. The Abreu one was one that had some like red flags as like, Mm -hmm. sure, he's good, but aren't we going to get another better one of him anyway, at some point? Like, why are we doing this now? Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes as, as incredible as SDS is with content, Sometimes they make me scratch my head a little bit, but at least that means they're giving me enough content to scratch my head about, Mm -hmm. you know, like that's, you always have to remember 
They could just give you nothing. They could just release the game and say, here, play it for 12 months. We'll make you pay another $60 for the next one. So at least they give you stuff to work for. Um, before I let you go, we're going to do something I don't think it's ever been done on this podcast. We're going to talk about basketball for a minute. Um, you are Milwaukee Bucks' maybe number one Twitter fan. And as someone who has like an in and out relationship with basketball, as far as like, I don't watch religiously, but like when the Nets were, I'm a Nets fan, when they were making their run, I was like, what's Kevin Durant going to do tonight? Let's watch what mm-hmm. Kevin Durant does. Um, how many, uh, how many games do the Bucks need to win? What, what are we talking here? What's your prediction? Two. So you're uh, saying, right are you now saying the series Bucks? is tied two, two, and I think it's going to be Bucks and six. Bucks and six. It's hardcore Bucks and six. Mm-hmm. Well, I was originally Bucks and seven, but uh, <laughs> I was like, with the energy, um, with, oh, excuse me, the lack of energy that they play to start uh, uh, game four's first half and the fact that they were still able to pull out that win, um, if they can come out with just a little bit of energy, which they'll have to do as the away team for game five, uh, if they snag game five, I say Bucks and six. If they lose game five, I will say Bucks and seven. You're just going to keep adding a game to it until it's mathematically <laughs> impossible. <laughs> I love that. Um, what is the X factor for the Bucks other than energy, as you've as you've okay. explained? Is it just you know Giannis has to be Giannis, or is there something underlying maybe? Um, I think the guy who doesn't give the whole bunch of credit that he should get, well, basically two are uh, Pat Connaughton and uh, Drew Holiday. So Pat Connaughton, he is like the fire off the bench. I know we all think about Bobby Portis and he brings that energy and Bobby is fantastic in the minutes he gets. But uh, Pat Connaughton, he hit, he hit some really valuable threes. He was actually the best player uh, in game four with a plus 24. So if Pat Connaughton can bring that energy, hit those clutch threes, then on the same note, I know many people are undermining Drew Holiday because his offensive production just has not been there at a consistent level. However, uh, you look at Chris Paul's numbers, you looked, you look at Devin Booker's numbers from game three specifically when he didn't even play the fourth quarter. Uh, that's all thanks to Drew Holiday. So if uh, Drew can keep up his defense and if he can score a couple extra buckets, uh, those are going to be the X factors to decide uh, if the Bucks win. Giannis, he just got, he just has to be Giannis. And Chris Middleton, I'm not worried about him because uh, he shows up in the clutch when he has to show up in the clutch. Mm-hmm. Uh, basketball fans, you heard it here. Maybe not first, but at least second, Bucks and six. Uh, so, Ashley, before we let you go, if for some reason people don't know where to find you, please let them know every single place they can they can find your content. Yeah, sure. So of course the main one is Twitch. I'm Ashley underscore Sanders. I do have a YouTube by the same name. Uh, Just keep in mind the YouTube videos are literally just exported Twitch streams with a whole bunch of uh, recently YouTube shorts from some clips. So I do want to expand on that. Uh, Twitter is my most active social media outside of Twitch. So Ashley 22 Sanders. And then just started an Instagram a couple months ago. So that is relatively new, but it is Ashley underscore 22 underscore Sanders. There's an Ashley underscore Sanders that has it exists but it hasn't been used in who knows how long so maybe one of those days i'll be able to get that but for now it's that very convoluted title for instagram (laughs) well guys make sure you go find her uh again just so you know i will not be streaming until my new capture card comes i will update the world on that uh as soon as it happens i don't anticipate it taking very long truth be told elgato customer service is fantastic in my experience so hopefully they keep that up um the streams are not stopping. They're just on a little little brief pause. Uh, so, guys, thank you so much for listening. Next week, I think it's just going to be me. I don't know if I'll have a guest. Maybe we will. Who knows? Uh, we fly by the seat of our pants here. So this has been Ashley Sanders, a trailblazer, student of the game who takes notes during her streams, and just an overall very fun person. So, Ashley, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, too. All right, everybody. I will talk to you all next week. <laughs>